Welcome to the RSM West Midlands branch webinar. Um, RSM West Midlands and many other branches obviously across the organisation aim to provide members with opportunities for recording CPD through these events and many others that take place. Um, bearing that in mind, please view the RSM website for information on upcoming webinars. This can be found uh, using the network and events tab or alternatively follow RSM West Midlands LinkedIn page where we obviously promote quite a few of the events that are taking place. Prior to this event, can I draw your attention to the RSM Risk Excellence Awards 2023? Um, the closing date for entries was last Friday on the 3rd of February and RSM are extremely grateful for the record number of entries that have been received this year. Um, these awards help to celebrate risk excellence and all those that contribute to protecting people, reputations and profits. On the 23rd, uh, sorry, 20th of March, RSM will be announcing the finalists for the various awards, so please keep a look out um, for posts obviously on the LinkedIn as well, where further information will be provided. Um, tomorrow, uh, the 10th of March, we have the deadline for the RSM Hummingbird Bursary that is funded by L'Oreal. Um, successful um, applicants for the Hummingbird Bursary will be rewarded with places on the RSM Managing Health and Safety Risks, the Essentials Training Course. Um, again, for further details, go to the RSM website. For those that would like information on other events that are taking place, the next meeting through a branch is taking place on Monday the 13th at uh, 6 p.m., so uh, the same time as we do, um, through RSM Northwest, and this is on the subject of fire safety management. Um, some will also be aware of a series of professional development webinars that are taking place through RSM, um, with the next one scheduled to take place on the 16th of March. Um, this is a lunchtime webinar at 1 p.m., and that's with Laura Alcott. Um, many will be aware of Laura, um, who is a great speaker, on this occasion, Laura will be discussing standing out from the crowd and preparing for an interview. So this is obviously a must watch for anybody that's looking to move jobs or that's in the process of, of applying for any jobs. Please spare some time as well to visit the RSM member resource hub as this continues to grow with information for members on a weekly basis. Here you can also access recordings of pre uh, sorry, previous professional development webinars that have taken place through the RSM and much more. Um, for this evening's webinar on selecting a safe ladder, we have Steve Booker. For those who are not aware of Steve, Steve is the chair of the Ladder Association Training Committee and PASMA Training Committee. He's deputy chair of PASMA and vice chair of IPATH Training Committee. Steve is also a group or also the group managing director of Kentec Training um, with a base in Kent. Um, with all of these commitments, we're extremely grateful to Steve for sparing the time to deliver this webinar on behalf of obviously RSM West Midlands. Steve, as you can imagine, is extremely knowledgeable in this sector and is sure to provide valuable information during this webinar that can be taken away and used in the working environment or possibly when com completing those all important DIY tasks at home, which many of us will use a ladder. Um, finally, thank you again to our networks manager, Julie, for assisting with this event. Mike, our branch chair, uh, vice chair, sorry, for questions at the end. Uh, please again use the questions tab to ensure that any questions can be presented to Steve, who will be more than happy to answer uh, where practicable. And to Steve for presenting this webinar again, we are grateful for you to spare the time. Over to you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Well, uh... Thank you again for the opportunity to talk tonight. And uh, yeah, as many people often say, as you introduced me there, um, I'm one of the few people that have managed to end up, uh, whether it was I didn't take a step backward when everyone else did, uh, but I ended up um, sitting as chair of many of the associations or work at height associations, um, training committees, and you know, the honor of becoming um, deputy chair of PASMA with me moving to the chair of PASMA later on this year. So um, I'm very proud of, of reaching that. And I think it's just a final testament that I've reached that age where um, the people that I used to look up to have actually retired. And it's now me and a few others that have reached the, the lofty heights of being the old school. So um, yeah, 
the tonight though i want to talk to you if i may about steps ladders etc and the effects on the recent changes with em 131 and just to give a bit more insight as to what the standard um, was changed for um, some of the impact it's had on safety and some of the issues that it's raised around people so uh, if uh, i may turn my camera off so we can focus on my actual uh, presentation so um, since the introduction of the new EM 131 standard, we've heard comments um, from many users that my new leaning ladder won't fit in my van. You know, apart from checking the obvious that the person's not bought a smaller van, it's sometimes because the new leaning ladders uh, now have a stabilizing bar at the bottom. And many people have, have said, you know, why is that? Well, the revision of the EM 131 design standard for portable ladders, which led to the changes in leaning ladder dimensions, was not done to annoy people, it was done to keep them safe. And it was done to reduce the number of people injured or worse when using ladders. Leaning ladders, like step ladders, are now wider at the base than they are at the top. Why, you may ask? It's because it makes them more stable. And if it makes them more stable, it makes them safer. So you think of things like the pyramids, the Eiffel Tower. When we look at these, these uh, uh, structures, long-standing iconic structures that are not the shape, they're not the shape because they just look pretty, they're the shape because it makes them more stable. In the case of ladders, this was also proven by extensive research and testing carried out by the UK's Loughborough University on behalf of the HSE. So we know that it works just as well for the pyramids as it does for your leaning ladder and the pyramids have been around a little bit longer than we have. The, the dimensions or the standards themselves doesn't dictate that a stabilizing bar is used as the method of achieving the required dimension. A lot of people think that, you know, the standard said you must have a ladder and it must look like this. This isn't the case. The standard says that leaning ladders longer than three meters must be wider at the base and the width depends on the length of the ladder. But it's up to the designers and the manufacturers how they achieve this wider dimension. And a stabilizing bar is just one of the solutions. If you shop around, you will find there are other solutions, which mean the width can be reduced for transportation, or when working in places where you need to temporarily adjust the width or the position of the width. You can see some examples on the screen now the important part is that it's designed as part of the ladder. It's permanently attached and it's not an accessory. So it's always available to the user. As is often the case, if you create a safety device that can be detached, people will have the habit or some people will have the habit of removing that said device um, and going back to some old methods that have been proven to be dangerous. So how did these changes to the EM131 standard happen? So standards are created by groups of experts, ladder designers, manufacturers and suppliers, safety professionals and health and safety regulators. The experts who come from all over Europe channeled their very diverse collective knowledge and experience on ladders and ladder use into setting out a minimum safety standards required to protect ladder users. Only when this group of experts determined that a, making ladders wider at the base was practical and sensible. B, that it would actually make leaning ladders safer. safer. C, they could agree on the dimensions and other requirements, which I can tell you took many months of discussion. And D, finally become part of the standard and, and that was only after public consultation and peer inquiry. And that is exactly what happened. So this isn't a group of people determining how ladders should look on their own. It was carefully done over months and months of, of discussion and planning. And um, again, as it said there, from public consultation. So next time you see a leaning ladder with a stabilizing bar or other means of increasing the base width, you'll know it's a good thing and you know that it's there for safety. So that explains why the first step of selecting a, a, a safe ladder is to make sure that you select one that is certified to a standard. Um, the wider base for leaning ladders is just one of the measures that was added to EM 131 in the revision process. The revision include other changes that made ladders more stable in 
other ways. It also made them stronger, stiffer, and sturdier, and improved the user information that must be provided with the ladder. So as you see for the slide there, we've got the width was increased, certainly a lot stronger. Um, rather than having multiple safe working loads, all ladders under EM131 now are certified with a working load of up to 150 kilos and sturdier in as much as um, there are slip tests done, there are pull tests done to make sure that these ladders will stay up even with some of the loads that might, have, might uh, be present on them. So most portable ladders are covered by the EM standard 131, DM131 published by the BSI in the UK as BSEM131. There are seven parts to the standard. It's extensive, and each part covers a different aspect or type of ladder. I'll show you a handy uh, reference guide in just a minute. The revised EM131 replaces the old and now withdrawn BS2037 for aluminium ladders and BS1129 for wooden ladders. Although, a standard can't be retrospectively um, applied. So these ladders, if in good, safe, operational um, standard, can still be used in the workplace. However, if you're looking to purchase a new ladder, then you would be looking to buy one that was under the new BSEM 131 standard. So designers and manufacturers are not obliged to follow EM 131 standard. As with most standards, they're not a legal requirement, but they are and employers are legally obliged to supply and use safe equipment. And certification to EM131 is one easy way of demonstrating that. Choosing ladders that are certified to EM131 standard helps you to demonstrate that you are providing safe equipment. It means you are getting a ladder that meets all the safety requirements that ladder experts across Europe agree are necessary. If you choose a ladder that doesn't meet the standard, then you don't know what you're getting. Based on tests I have seen, I certainly wouldn't be climbing any uncertified ladders. And I'm afraid you can't always trust everyone. Unfortunately, we have some examples of ladders marked as EM131, but they're not. They were accidents waiting to happen. Our organizations have a test and research center uh, amongst other BSI and, and TU be uh, test centers where some of these ladders that are being imported have been found to be not only slightly substandard, but really dangerous and failing in nearly every test that's placed upon them. So you want to be certain that the ladder has been certified as compliant to EM131 by a third party certification body, such as the Test and Research Center in Soham, the BSI themselves, or TUV. All of these are test houses where stringent test tests can be carried out in line with the uh, standards requirements. And the results from those tests can be published and certified so that you can see that the ladder you are buying is to that standard and has been tested thoroughly. So you should be able to ask the supplier for a copy of the certification. You can check with the certification body if that's a valid certificate. If the supplier cannot or will not provide you certification, then I would suggest you buy elsewhere. The ladder association members include manufacturers who only make ladders that are certified to the standard and suppliers who only sell or hire ladders that are certified to the standard. There are a list of those members on the ladder association website at ladderassociation.org. So if you only buy or hire ladders, I'd suggest you only buy or hire ladders that are certified to the standards and from ladder association members. That lays the groundwork for ensuring you always use safe equipment. So the next thing you need to do is to select the right type of ladder for each job. As you can see, you have lots to choose from. They will all have different names and they can all fall under different standards. So let's organize them a little bit Leading ladders and step ladders both fall under EM 131 parts 1, 2, and 3. Then we have ladders that can be used as both a leaning ladder and a step ladder. These are combination ladders which fall under EM 131 part 1, 2, and 3, but also multi hinge joint ladders. This type comes under EM 131 part 4. 
Sometimes these ladders are telescopic, which means they can be reduced in size for transportation and storage. Telescopic ladders have their own standard, which is EN131 part six. Other types of ladders you may choose from are step stools, which are basically a type of small step ladder for those looking for the certification to EM14183. Mobile ladders with platforms, sometimes called warehouse steps. These are EM131 part seven. And finally, roof ladders for use on pitch roofs with angles between 25 and 65 degrees. These sit under the British standard BS8634. So under the right, getting the right ladder for the task, if you're not sure, ask the manufacturer or supplier or hire company uh, for assistance in choosing the right one. But it's your responsibility to select the right equipment. When you've chosen, remember to make sure the ladder is certified to the right standard. So the slide on screen acts as a handy reference for that point. So let's just look at the uh, different standards of which there are many. So EM131 ladders, they're now put into two different classifications. So you've got professional and non-professional. Ladders for professional use are the most durable, having been designed to withstand more demanding workplace conditions. They're intended to be used at work and there's no reason why they can't be used at home or domestically too. However, ladders for domestic use or non-professional are intended for lighter, more occasional use. They should only ever be used for home or domestic use. They're not suitable for use in the workplace setting. We've had questions from people um, over the last few weeks asking if that applies even in work, workplaces where they might not be subject to particularly heavy use like schools and colleges. It does apply. These ladders are not suitable for any workplace. And for any accident or incident that was investigated and it was found that a non-professional ladder was used at the workplace, that would come quite easily under you know, incorrect equipment. So both professional and domestic ladders can hold up to 150 kilos in weight. This includes the user, their tools, and any equipment or materials they might be carrying at the time. The key difference between the two classes is their durability. The main point to remember here is that if you're using ladders at work, they must be professional class EM131 ladders. You'll be able to tell if the ladder is professional or non-professional because it will be marked on the ladder. Because again, another point with the new standard was the labeling. So ladders are made of different materials, including aluminium, fiberglass, wood, and steel. Each material has properties that make the ladder suitable for more applications and unsuitable for others. It's very important to choose the right material. There was a terribly sad case last year where a joiner, a 37-year-old father of two, was electrocuted while working on an aluminium ladder just 12 inches away from two electrical cables and a phone line. The ladder got tr trapped in one of the cables and the man was electrocuted and fell 13 feet to his death. Yeah, you know, we hear incidents like this all too often and a little bit of planning and organisation and understanding and appreciation of the risks involved can mean these people have never have been in this situation. So our advice is to keep ladders well clear of live equipment and particularly high voltage overhead cables. If the work is unavoidable and you need to use a ladder, please use one made of fiberglass or wood when working around electrical systems. And remember, ladders aren't insulated, they are made of non-conductive material. Another point to consider when you're selecting your ladder is whether it's long enough for the job. Here's some of the terminology you should know. So ladders have a standard height or standing height, which will be stated on the label. That tells you the maximum height you can stand at, or in other words, where your feet will be if you climb as high as you're allowed to climb. Ladders will also have a maximum length, which is self-explanatory. It tells you the maximum length of the ladder can be extended to. And finally, ladders have a safe working height. That's the height you can reach safely without overreaching when working at the top of the ladder. And it's a key piece of information that you need. With leaning ladders, the maximum safe working height considers that you can't stand on the top three rungs and that it needs to be set at an angle of 75 degrees or a ratio of approximately four to one. 
So it's four units up for every one unit out. For step ladders, it considers that you can't stand on the top three treads unless it has a platform. And if it's a combination ladder being used in step ladder mode, you can't stand on the top four rungs. Manufacturers normally confirm the safe working height in their product data sheet or catalogs if not. You can work out from the ladder's maximum length and standing height. In theory, there are no limits on how high a maximum safe working height for a ladder can be. That's down to the manufacturers. But in reality, you'll find it difficult to buy a ladder where it's more than, say, 10 metres. Don't worry, though. You don't need to remember all these numbers because ladders come with comprehensive user instructions in the form of an instruction manual and labels on the ladder itself, like the one you can see on the screen. The key information you'll need to keep you safe when is contained in here. Manufacturers must provide this information with the ladders, so it's, if it's missing, ask. Of course, like anything. I am covering today, you'll find details in the guidance documents we're launching, which is safe use of ladders and step ladders and the Ladder Association's code of practice, both of which are available electronically from ladderassociation.org. So, two additional points. When we talk about safe working height on the ladder and step ladder, never overreach. Keep your belt buckle or your navel within the styles or sides of the ladder. The ladder needs to be long enough so that you are not tempted to do this. And never stand your ladder on boxes or blocks or bricks or any similar item to gain additional height. Get a ladder the right height and use it the right way. So if you followed all five steps that I've covered so far, you've got yourself a suitable ladder uh, for the job in hand. And as it's certified to a standard, you know that in theory, it's a safe piece of equipment. So why only in theory? Well, we need to cover inspection now. Now, of course, even a brand new ladder can be damaged in transit. So inspection, both by the operator using it and then our um, thorough examinations we carry out on them and detailed checks are a must for a safe ladder system. So I'd like to take the next few minutes to talk to you all about ladder inspections, a safety critical part of ensuring you're always using safe equipment. So in the previous slides, I've laid out the groundwork there. If you follow the advice, you will find yourself in the right ladder for the job. You can be confident that at least you started off with a safe piece of equipment. Ladder inspections are carried out because you need to be confident the equipment is a safe piece of equipment now. So inspections are a requirement of the work at height regulations. So if you're not already doing everything I'm covering so far today, I would ask you to consider starting to. So there are two distinct types of inspection. We've got the pre-use checks, which as they say, are checks and inspections that are done, not formal, they're not normally recorded, but they're carried out by the operative just to make sure the equipment is safe to use now. And then we have the formal documented detailed inspections. So pre-use checks are done by the user who must be competent for the job and results don't need to be documented as I've said and the aim is to ensure that the ladder is safe to use right now. So detailed inspections on the other hand are the responsibility of the employer. They must be documented and the aim is to check that the ladder is safe for continued use. So these periodic checks will be more focused more direct and carried out by someone who's received suitable training to know what to look for. Or as we often say when it comes to inspection, three simple words, which is at or do. What are we looking at? What are we looking for? And what do we do if we find it? So in the case of a simple leaning ladder, you know, the at, when we're talking about what are we looking at, the obvious answer would be a ladder. But in inspection language, we look at the components so we're looking at the rungs, the styles, the brackets, the feet, the end caps. Um, so the at is the component parts. The four is the pre predetermined kind of damage that we might come across. And the do, if we find said damage, then do we quarantine? Do we um, dispose of the ladder? Again, these systems need to be put in place. So 
some of the more details on pre-use inspections or checks that you might carry out, they should be done at the beginning of every work shift or working day. Um, quite simple, the detailed inspection, as I said, checking that they're ready for continuous use. So most operatives, the first thing I'd say is don't make an assumption that someone who can climb a ladder is fully able or knowledgeable to carry out a pre-use inspection of a ladder. So this is something that needs to be taught, something that needs to be trained. Now, again, they've got full inspection training courses, but the pre-use check is something that's covered in the user courses. So although someone, it always pays to have someone on the company that's actually been trained to formally inspect ladders, um, rest assured that when people uh, attend, for instance, ladder association um, user courses, pre-use inspection and what to look for is covered within those courses themselves. So um, we've got to carry out these at the beginning of work, every working day, as we said, or we could be looking at when something significant has happened. So if someone's dropped the ladder, if it's been left unattended for a while, if it's been on a roof rack or transported, or if it's been moved from an area where it possibly could have been contaminated or corroded by certain chemicals or substances, then we need to have an inspection again. So we've got pre-use inspection is a visual, tactile and functional check. Yeah, so eyes, feel and functional means anything that moves, slides, clips, locks, you check them all working as they should be. The user should be looking for obvious defects that would pre prevent the safe and correct use of the ladder. Remember, this inspection is being carried out by the user and they're checking that the ladder is safe to use right now. I will not list everything that you should be looking for today as we'd be here for hours and hours as the task that requires the training to do it properly. So, so as we said, if you want pre-use inspection, that will be included in the likes of Ladder Association user training. If you um, want a full formal inspection, which is a little bit more detailed understanding and knowledge around faults and how to find them, then the Ladder Association also offer an inspector's course. But anyway, some of the things we might be looking for. So feet, now you've got some of the obvious ones. Are they missing? Are they loose? Are they excessively worn, damaged, corroded? Yeah, the ladder could slip if they're not in good order. So check them again when moving the ladder from soft to dirty ground to a solid surface. So again, they can become contaminated. Make sure that the dirt doesn't create a risk of the ladder slipping. We've also got things like the styles, which is the sides of the ladders. Again, make sure they're not bent, bowed, twisted, dented, cracked, corroded or rotten, or in some cases, different lengths. If they are, the ladder could buckle or collapse under load. Check the locking mechanism. Again, make sure it's working properly and functioning. None of the components or fixings are bent, missing or damaged. Check that the locking bars are fully engaged and they can be tightened and secured before use. Remember, these are just examples. So ultimately, you know, there's a full comprehensive list of what needs to be checked on each kind of ladder and step ladder. You should also check the current user manual as it may identify additional items that need to be checked, especially for specific ladders like telescopic ladders or multi-hinge joint ladders. So here's a simple one. If the user spots any defects, they should not use the ladder. It's as simple, isolate, tag and report. So you see on the slide now, we've got a split in a platform. Now that's caused by overloading or dropping or impact in some way. Um, the picture on the right clearly shows a very corroded ladder. Now again, that may not be dangerous, but we'd have to make an awful lot more effort in searching around every nook and cranny of that to look to see if that corrosion has got structural. And then we have the uh, the favourite, which is wrapping tape around things. So can we pass a ladder that's got tape? Now I've had this situation several times where I've actually sat there and pulled all this tape off to find nothing underneath it at all. 
I'm sure some of the apprentices just get bored sometimes. But again, it could be a makeshift repair to a damaged ladder. So we have to make sure that we are looking out for it. So that gives you five clear step checklists, if you like, to work through. And when you when we want to be sure that we're selecting the right ladder for the job, but I did say there were seven steps. So we've touched upon um, that very end there part where we're looking at uh, the advice so far and have you got a safe ladder in theory? That's because ladders can get damaged or their condition deteriorate through use or while in storage or transportation. Just because a ladder was safe yesterday does not mean it's safe today. And certainly a brand new ladder is not necessarily safe. There's very few courier companies that actually will transport ladders now um, because they're, they're difficult to transport. Big long aluminium things that get in the way. So make sure they're using safe equipment. You'll need to inspect the ladder regularly. Now we can look at the inspection requirements for ladders. So pre-use checks are important but aren't enough. As an employer, you must conduct regular formal documented inspections of any ladder or step ladder you own or have hired in. These formal inspections must be completed by a competent person, scheduled and planned at appropriate intervals using a ladder register, documented, and where required, followed up with action. So let's go over them in turn. So inspections need to be completed by a competent person. That means someone who's been trained, had some experience and understanding. So the detailed inspection is a more in-depth visual and functional inspection than the pre-use checks. Again, it's a task that a person should be trained to do. Their aim is to establish if the ladder is safe for continued use or if maintenance or remedial work is required. So they need to know what they are looking for. Some people attending today's, they may have asked, ladder inspections can be managed in-house and the answer is yes as long as the individual doing the ladder inspections in-house is responsible are trained and competent and can act independently the ladder association as i said has an inspection training course aimed at anyone whose duties include the detailed inspection of ladders inspections must be scheduled and planned at appropriate regular intervals it's a good idea to use ladders register for this. The ladder register can be electronic, it can be paper, it can be whatever system that works for you as long as it records the required information. So how often is regular? Well, how often do you do detailed inspections will depend upon how often the ladder is used. As a guide, the ladder ladders used frequently, let's say daily, should be inspected at least every three months. If used occasionally, let's call that weekly, then we recommend inspection every six months. If used less often, monthly, then at least every 12 months they should be inspected and documented, and that should be sufficient. In between these scheduled inspections, you also need to do interim inspections if there's significant risk to the ladder's condition. It has deteriorated in any way or being affected by any kind of substance or condition or environment it's been in. If you own several ladders, it's a good idea, as I've said, to keep a ladder registered to help you organise, plan and plan the inspections and maintenance. This can be whatever format it needs to be, as I've said. You know, some people knock up an Excel sheet, some people love paper still, and some people will go out and buy an inspection um, programme or app that works well for them as well. So the results should be documented. You need to keep a record of all the detailed inspections, including interim inspections. The record can be whatever format you need, as I've said already. It should include various pieces of information, such as a note of any significant damage or where identified. But you can find a more complete list on our code of practice. So these records provide a snapshot of the state of the ladder over time and must be made available to a health and safety inspector if you're asked to do so. And, you know, without any doubt, this is when your records really come into their own. Now, if you've had an unfortunate event, someone's been injured or worse, then many of you as health and safety professionals will be aware that um, 
you know, environmental health, health HSE inspectors will come in and they, they won't just look at the equipment and the person that was that was involved in the incident or accident. They'll look at the company's inspection process. They'll look at the risk management. They'll look at the training. And this is where paperwork is a savior. If you're a company that takes your responsibilities you know, seriously and you ensure that you've got competent people using safe equipment in a safe manner, then you should have the paperwork there to back all that up and prove that, that system, those systems are in place. All too often, as a training professional, we are called in after a company has been um, investigated by one of the uh, bodies like the HSE, and they know they've got legal action coming against them, but they, they know they've got to get their house in order. And you think it's it would have been so easy to put this right but everyone thinks health and safety is something they can do tomorrow because it doesn't make you money. But believe you me, if you don't do it, it will certainly cost you money. So, as I've said, it, the records can be whatever format you want and what's most appropriate for your organization. So it should include, to say, various pieces of equipment, but if you look on our code of practice, we have got that listed. So we've had some questions today, as I've said, about um, what we can do. So when it comes to ladder inspections, am I allowed to do my own repairs? Um, pop rivets, self-tapping screws, um, general persuasion with a hammer if something's bent the wrong way? Well, we would categorically not recommend any product which requires the inv invasive alteration of a completed ladder, for instance, by drilling into the ladder and applying rivets or fixings of any kind. Certainly, um, trying to do makeshift repairs on your own ladders is a dangerous practice. Because really, when you look at the standard and the fact they've been tested and certified, as soon as you start working on them, you take them out of that. Only the manufacturer or their approved agent are allowed to do remedial work on the ladder. Um, it doesn't mean to say that you can't do it, but it's just one thing that will not earn you any any brownie points when it comes to it comes to um, trying to prove that you've provided safe equipment. As often when I'm on site, you know, I find I go to places, I've, I get called out to many organisations, large and small, and you see the makeshift repairs that people have done to keep you know a ladder worth 150 pounds still operational. Yet if it, an incident or an accident was to occur with that ladder. You know, any inspector worth his uh, worth his weight would just tear them to pieces with the repairs and makeshift, you know, bodged up repairs, if you would, that can be carried out. So, crucially, and detailed inspections must be followed up with actions. So, if you find a ladder with a serious visible defect, mark it as unfit for further use, and then follow the same steps I've outlined earlier when I spoke about pre-use inspections. So again, the most important thing to do straight away is withdraw it from use. So there's no risk of someone else picking it up and using it. Yeah, one thing we have to remember, unless you are fully aware of the risks associated with, if you like, second second rate shoddy damaged equipment, then people are in the habit of trying to get a job done. So you can end up with people having incidents on ladders that should have been pulled out of service. So pull it out of service and then you should either destroy them by cutting them down the center and then placing them up for recycling or arrange for them to be repaired if possible by the manufacturer or their authorized agent. You might be wondering say, how do I know if a visible defect is serious enough to make the ladder dangerous? Well, I can't give you no simple answers here because every situation is of its own merit. But what I will say is it's fully covered in the Ladder Association's inspection course, um, and we have a series of, you know, progressively um, more damaged ladders that we can show you where the line is between safe, acceptable, and those that need to be withdrawn. So that's a very brief overview, if you like, of what's involved in inspecting ladders. And it kind of completes the seven-step checklist of how to ensure that you're using safe ladders. I hope this part of the presentation was was useful and um, you know, you've learned something new and hopefully put it into practice.
if anyone is listening who doesn't already have a robust procedure for ladder inspections, I hope that you've just decided to put it on your to-do list. Remember, for more detail, you should read the two guidance documents that um, I've got up there, which are available from the Ladder Association uh, website or contacting them directly. So safe use of ladders and step ladders and the Ladder Association code of practice. So I hope this presentation has answered many of your questions. Um, if there's not, I'll take whatever questions and do my very best to uh, answer them. But uh, anything you want to do, then again, I always welcome people to remark on social media, but hashtag ladder safety. I never quite understand at my age what hashtagging is all about, but apparently that's what we've got to do is hashtag ladder safety. So thank you very much for joining me and I hope that was insightful. So back to you, Tony, if I may. Okay, I'm not sure if Tony's there. Can you hear me, Steve, yeah? Yes, yes I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, right. Oh, didn't have, didn't have many questions a minute ago. They're coming in now. Right, if you can answer these for me then, please. Right. Recently, recently had an issue where a safety consultant stated the use of scaffolding ladder couplers was insufficient as no test data was available to prove their safe working load. I argued that I had a single coupler could be used if opposing the fully enclosed the style of the ladder again. But this person rejected this. Where can I find such test data? I think the National Association of Scaffolding Contractors, the NASC, has done some testing on this. So my first instance would be to go to their website, the NASC, because um, um, everything scaffolding, scaffold couplers, there has been an awful lot of, of uh, testing being done by that organisation around that. Because obviously they, they tend to use ladders and they use you know couplers to secure those ladders into scaffolding. So that would be my, my point of view for that one. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, I like this one. What is an acceptable dent or knock, please? Would a light small dent without cracks be acceptable if monitored? <laughs> At what particular position on the ladder, though? Oh, I don't know. That, that That's just a question that's coming as of that. Well, see, it's quite uh, normal that if you've got, say, a rung, a rung of a ladder, if you've got a small dent that doesn't actually um, cover any of the, uh, if you like, the turns or corners of the rung, and it's only on the flat of the rung and it is it doesn't protrude to either edge, then it may not be a full reason to get rid of it, you know. But if it actually bends the edges, you know, the corners of the square, if you like, then that actually becomes structural. But it's very difficult to give an answer on that without seeing it. And this is this is one of the things that we teach this on the inspection course by actually showing people progressively worst cases of uh, dents to styles, dents to rungs, and saying, you know, you see where this one comes to this point, it doesn't affect that structurally, but at this point it does. Yeah. Um, it's one of those that it's very difficult to make a statement about what's right, wrong. It really does depend upon each ladder and, and the, the extent of the damage. Okay, that's great. So actually, based on training you might have received, you'd be able to identify that yourself. Yes, you... that's, the, that's the aim of the inspection. We've got we've gone to great lengths to make sure that that kind of information is covered in the inspection course. Yeah, and I, okay. you know, if, if you're never sure, you always err on the side of caution, quarantine the ladder, and then contact someone who has knowledge, which is in the first instance is normally the manufacturer. But to be perfectly honest with you, they will normally tell you. Um, their advice is to buy a new ladder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it at the moment for questions coming in. I can't see any others. Mike, well, I think we I think we have one sandwiched in between those two. And yeah, it's yeah. how yeah, how would you recommend fixing the ladder tag to ladders slash steps? Table tie. Sorry. Okay. Simple one cable ties. Whatever you do, do not drill, rivet screw um any kind of label holder onto the style of the ladder bottom line you must not do anything that's intrusive to the structure of the ladder you know in real terms with two screws with two rivets actually put the ladder 
to a dangerous state. It may not, but the fact is we don't know how much stress is on that point. Um, and it wasn't tested with two holes in that position or three holes in that position. So best advice, do never do anything structural to the ladder. Use cable ties. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Okay. One, of the, one of the things Steve, with cable ties. From myself. Sorry, go on. Oh, sorry, Steve. Just a quick one from myself. Um, when we're advising customers, I'm not sure if you've touched on this overly, for instance, during the presentation, apologies, because I've been a little bit on and off. But um, we advise, obviously, that they should secure ladders to the building when they're not in use, just to try and prevent, let's say, unauthorised use, because um, we have had um, customers in the past, clients that have um, had a situation where unauthorised people have used a ladder and end up having an incident which has obviously resulted in a claim against the business, which they obviously yeah. couldn't fight or couldn't dispute because of access to the ladder in the first place. Again, this is just basic risk management. If, you, if you've got a ladder that can be accessed easily and it's in a place where unauthorised access could be gained, then you need to take it out of, out of easy access. Um, there's no quick and easy answer to say, leave it where it is. I mean, you've seen the obvious where people try and strap a scaffold ball to a ladder saying you can't climb it but it depends on the environment it's in but my general advice is if you can take them away the lower the lower level ladder take it away from wherever it is put it somewhere safe where it can't be accessed i mean it's, a, it's an easy job the next morning just to bring it out from storage and place it against the structure and secure it but leaving any ladder in a place where it potentially could be climbed is an unnecessary risk yeah, thank you. And that's all the questions we have for you tonight, Steve. Um, Tony, do you have any closing comments or would you like me to finish up now? I think we're having some problems with Tony's sound. So I'll um, say a huge thank you, Steve, for giving up your valuable time, especially after the busy week you've had um, to deliver this presentation this evening. I'd like to thank Tony and Mike for also volunteering their time. In um, no, just a, again, a thank you to Steve for um, his time during the presentation. Losing Tony there. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for attending. Um, the recording will be on the RSM YouTube channel early next week. And if any of you would like attendance certificates, they'll come out automatically this time tomorrow. So I'd like to wish everyone a good evening and we hope to see you at the next West Midlands branch webinar. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.